we all know Darwin's theory. We all know we are the product of evolution, but we are not only the product of evolution. In the past thousands of years, always someone from outer space interfered, changed our DNA. The DNA specialist can prove this. The problem is they cannot go to public because the public does not understand this at the moment. You see, our astrophysics and astronomers, they are looking for traces of life out there in a microscopical way, but they do not accept that life, extraterrestrial life, is already here and was already here, etc. So evolution, yes, but not only evolution. Somebody always mixed something. By the way, that's part of the old holy books. Read the Bible and the so-called gods created humans according their own image. So we are not only product of evolution, we are the offspring of something else. I mean, Ezekiel was an eyewitness. At that time, that was roughly uh, 700 BC. He was captured by, by the Babylonians. He was a prisoner in a camp near a river, which has the name of Chebar. And he's there with different other captured people, prisoners. And then they see a light in the sky and they hear a noise. And Ezekiel describes the noise. He compares the noise with the thundering of a waterfall. So he does not only see something like an illusion or a dream or an apparition, he also hears what he sees. He sees the thundering of a waterfall, etc. And then he describes what it is. You know, in the beginning, Ezekiel believes that this must be God. Ezekiel, by the way, by profession, is high priest at the temple of Jerusalem. But at his time, the Babylonians overtook Jerusalem. So, so Ezekiel was one of the captured from Jerusalem. So, but by profession, he is high priest. So in the beginning, he believes that he's the almighty God. So he fell down on his knees because he thinks, as a priest, it's my duty to welcome, to give honor to the almighty God. And then he realized that this is not God, that it is something different. And then he describes in every detail what he sees, not only the noise which he hears, he describes the wings, he describes the wheels, he describes the legs. He clearly say the legs were out of metal and the wheel is something very, very complicated. You know, at his time, the wheel is known, but the, the wheel of his time, the wheels go for, for, uh, forward and backward. The wheels of Ezekiel, which he sees here, they do not go only forward and backward, but right and left at the same time without making a steering movement. You know, when you sit in a car today, you want to go in a curve, you make a steering movement, you know, to move on the right and the left. Ezekiel's wheel is going forward, backward, right, left, without moving. And that confuses him completely. He writes four times about this wheel, which could go in any direction without any, any movement. And by the way, some uh, well, 30 years ago, I had a secret speech at the NASA in Huntsville, in the United States. And I was talking about Ezekiel there too. And after it, we had a dinner. And then the chief scientist of the construction of NASA, Mr. Joe Blumry, came to me and he said, Eric, that was very interesting. But what he said about Ezekiel, I don't believe a word. Ezekiel simply had a vision. He had a dream, but this is not nothing reality. And he wanted to criticize me, he said, it's my business. I'm a, I'm a rocket constructor. I will de debunk you sooner or later. And, and he confessed he never read Ezekiel. So after this, he was very friendly and very correct. He started to read Ezekiel and he changed his mind completely. He really, he recalculated every detail which Ezekiel has written. The, the product was, a, the outcome was a book with a, a title, The Spaceship of Ezekiel by Joe Blumrick in the United States. So, and in the beginning of his books, he say that he started his uh, work by contradicting me, by debunking me, and he came to a complete different uh, point of view. So Ezekiel really described what he saw, and he described an extraterrestrial vehicle. Today we would call it maybe a UFO. And he got in contact with them because these <coughs> extraterrestrials they took him away. Ezekiel says, they brought me on a very, very high mountain. Read this in the Bible. It does not say 
they brought me on a mountain, on a very, very high mountain. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know, otherwise he would know it. Now the scholars, biblical scholars believe they brought him to Jerusalem, which is all nonsense. Ezekiel grew up in Jerusalem. He knew his home city. If it would have been Jerusalem, he would have said, they brought me to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, in Israel, there are no very, very high mountains. So he was in a complete strange place. He doesn't know where. And there, a, a being looking like a human in white clothes came to Ezekiel. And at the beginning, this man just says, oh, come on, you humans, you, you see nothing and you hear nothing, and you understand nothing. And then this strange being in white clothes gives Ezekiel a measuring instrument, some object with which you can measure, and orders Ezekiel, now please, human, you measure all this building in which we are here now. And Ezekiel, in the meantime, he clearly understood that this is not God. He asked back, why? Why should I measure this building? And the stranger said, that's the reason why we brought you up here, that you measure it. So he measures it. Read the Bible, chapter 44, pages and pages of measuring, long, large, how high, the steps, and everything. And then they brought him back to his own people. So that's in the, in, in the basic story of the Bible of Ezekiel. But the story continues. I said, this NASA man, Joe Blumrich, reconstructed the space vehicle which Ezekiel described. Now, in the Bible, he describes this building. How long, how large is this building? How many steps are there? Windows, etc. And another scientist from Germany, Mr. Hans Herbert Bayer, an engineer, he took Ezekiel's measurement. He wanted to know if this really makes sense, if it is a building or is it just a dream. And he reconstructed, he recalculated the building. It was very funny. So. One day, some years ago, 30 years ago, I had the yellow big envelope on my desk at home, and there was this Mr. Hans Herbert Bayer, an engineer, who told me, dear Mr. von Däniken, I reconstructed the building, and here are the, the calculations and the pictures. I was fascinated. I said, come on, this is very interesting. And I asked this man, Mr. Hans Herbert Bayer, do you know Mr. Joe Blumrich's work from NASA? He said, I never heard of it. So I brought these two men together. Joe Blumrich from Natska, engineer Hans Herbert Bayer from Germany. And funny, the spaceship, which was reconstructed by the NASA man, fit perfectly into the building which Hans Herbert Bayer made. So the so-called building was nothing else but the base camp of the extraterrestrials. So in the meantime, we know very well what Ezekiel saw and what was the reason of all this. You know, when I was a boy, they teach me Eric, one day you will die, and then you will go before the throne of the Almighty God. And you, if you did good things in your life, you will come to paradise. Paradise is the place of absolute happiness. Paradise is the place where you are near to God. You adore God. You are happy. There is no war in paradise. But then you continue to read the Bible, and you learn, stop. There was a war in paradise. There was an archangel called Lucifer who came to the throne of the Almighty God and said, we don't serve you anymore. Then the archangel Michael came and threw out Lucifer out of paradise. So there was a war in heaven. So we have to change the word heaven into space. Heaven is not the happy place. Heaven was the place, it was a fight. So change the word heaven into space. Then we have these angels. I mean, angels, naturally, we believe they are the good ones. They are winged, they are, they are the helpers of God, they are peaceful. But angels, not only in the Bible, but including in the Bible, they are very, very bad beings from time to time. For example, in the book of the Kings, chapter 23, you can read that one angel descended and he killed 185,000 Assyrians, just like this. You know, no, no war, no weapons, no, no sword, no, no, nothing. He just killed 185,000 Assyrians. And by the way, just as a link, the same story you find on the temple wall in Edfu, Edfu is Egypt, in hieroglyphs. So how came that the same story is written in hieroglyphs in Egypt and we find it in the Bible? So 
these angels were warriors. The same thing with these cherubims. Cherubims are so-called the angels. No, they were practically, physically existing. They fight. They were not spiritual beings, not believing, nothing peaceful. It was a war. It was a war in heaven and space. You know, we have other old writings like the, the Mahabharata, which comes from India. And there in the, in the fourth book, in the so-called Mausala Purva, we have a guy with the name of Arjuna. Arjuna was taken up by the extraterrestrials, as a boy, by the way. He learns the language of them. So he speaks their language. And then he, they teach him in different belongings, in engineering, in astronomy, etc. And then uh, uh, Arjuna, by the way, when he's back on planet Earth, he describes what his experiences with these beings were. And he clearly, clearly say they had wars between each other. Some of the extraterrestrials, they wanted to enslave humans. They wanted to destroy us. Others want to take or steal our raw material, our energy source, and others were against him. So these beings, they had not the same opinion. They were against each other. And Arjuna described, described that one of the cities in the skies, they don't have a word like spaceship at that time. They call it cities in, in, on the firmament or in the sky. One of these cities in the firmament were destroyed, exploded. There was a war in heaven. And the cherubims were beings, not spiritual beings. We have to differentiate discoveries in old holy books and discoveries in facts, things which you can touch and photograph. The greatest one definitely is called Puma Punku. Puma Punku is roughly 4,000 meters high in the Andes, so in South America and Bolivia. And when you stay in Puma Punku, you stay before a gigantic platform, gigantic. It has a weight of 80 tons. Roughly 400 years ago, the Spanish conquerors came up there. Then they had in contact with the Inca. There, there were translators who understood, who made the translators. And the Inca, the, the boss of the Inca were there, and the Spanish conqueror, the boss, who was there, and they were standing before this platform. And the Spanish asked the Inca, even we Spanish, we would not be able to move such a gigantic platform. How did you manage this? And the answer of the Inca was, it was not us who moved this, it was the gods. The beings from, from sky who descended and they constructed this in one night. It's even the Inca who say it was not us. It was the beings from outer space, from the sky who did it. So the biggest discovery, in fact, is Puma Punku, Bolivia near the, the lake of Titicaca. If you want to see something incredible, moving megalithic blocks, then go there. We are not only the product of evolution, somebody always made changing in our evolution. And this changed our consciousness, of course, too. I still don't know why these extraterrestrials, they forced or helped our primitive Stone Age people to do these gigantic things. What was the purpose of it? I have no idea, except a basic camp. Look, if our uh, mountain climbers go up to the Himalaya, for example, they use basic camps. They do not go one day right up to the, to the top, that they make their stops. Now an extraterrestrial spaceship is in orbit. From the spaceship, smaller vehicles come down. The ancient Indians called them Vimanas. Out of these smaller vehicles, the extraterrestrial come out. They behave themselves similarly as today's ethnologists would behave. They learn some of our language. They teach some of our young people in different belongings. Now these extraterrestrials, they have their technology. Like our expedition, they have their photographs, they have their cameras, they have their measurement instrument. And they don't want to carry their technical equipment all the time around with them. So they need a basic camp, a camp which they can preserve their technology against the storm, against the wind, against the sun, against the humans, against the animals, against the nature. So from time to time, we find buildings which were basic camps which the extraterrestrials wanted because they don't want to take their stuff all the time around with them. Every culture of the world has the return of the gods. Absolutely every. Now, 
We are educated in a Christian world. And we Christians, we believe that one day Jesus will return. But the Jewish community believes that one day their Messiah will return. The Muslim community believe that one day their Mahdi will return. Roughly 400 years ago, the white conquerors visited different tribes. And always the tribe believed that the visitors are the long-awaited gods. Of course, we are only humans, but the natives believe they are the gods. You know, James Cook, for example, the British explorer, he came for the first time to Hawaii. What happened? The natives fell all down on their ground and adored him because they believe he's the long-awaited god. In Central America, Hernando Cortes came to today's Mexico, and even the ruler of Mexico at that time, the, the king, Moctezuma, he fell down on his ground. He believed that the Spanish are the long-awaited God. In South America, Francisco Pizarro, Spanish conqueror, he came to the Inca. The same situation. They all fell down on the ground. They believe he's the long-awaited God. So this story of awaiting somebody is a story which every culture knows and every religion until today. Why? Extraterrestrials, when they were here, they studied us, as I said, like uh, ethnologists. One day, their job was done, and they said to a few uh, humans, we leave you now. We go back now to our home base, but we will return in a far future. Why in a far future? The distances between one star and the others are measured in light years. So you cannot just jump like this in two days, far away and come back. You always have a few thousand years before, before they can come back. So they told it to our ancestors, we will come back, do not forget it. Hand this down to the next generation. That's why this promise of the returning of the gods comes. And as I said, every culture knows it and every religion until today. One extraterrestrial object, which is clearly described not only in the Bible, but also in the Kebra Negest. Kebra Negest is the book of the kings of the Ethiopians. It's the so-called Ark of the Covenant. In the Bible, we read about the Ark of the Covenant. Moses had to construct a, a box completely out of gold, inside and, and outside. And what was the inside was not human. In the Kebra Negest, this is the book, I said, the book of the kings of the oldest Ethiopian tradition. In the, in the book of the kings, they say clearly, the inside is not human. The inside comes from the, the guardians of the sky. Now, today, we know this Ark of the Covenant first has come to the hands of King Solomon. King Solomon constructed a gigantic temple in today's Jerusalem. And in the highest place, he deposited the Ark of the Covenant. King Solomon had a connection with the Queen of Sheba, and they had together a son. His name was Bainalekem. Everyone who owned the Ark of the Covenant was protected by the gods. They, they always won the wars, etc. Now the son, Bainalekem, one day he stole the Ark of the Covenant out of the Temple of Jerusalem, and he brought it to his mother, the Queen of Sheba, which is today Yemen. And it's clearly described in the, the Kebra Negest, the book of the kings of Ethiopia, that he f was fl flying over the land. There in the holy book of the Ethiopians, they say that King Solomon was the owner of different flying wagons, flying machines. One of them he made a gift to uh, the Queen of Sheba. So the son, Bainalekem, he stole the Ark of the Covenant. He was flying over the land, over the Nile, until the, the place. So now the Ethiopians, today's Ethiopians or the Yemenis, they adored the, the Ark of the Covenant, but everyone who came too close of it died, died in a terrible way. It's described that their nails on the foot and on the hands fell out. They become pale. The unborn children in, in the womb of the woman died, etc. So it was definitely radiation. This machine was radioactive. So the Ethiopians had, were afraid of, of this object and they buried it deep down. We know today where it is. It is in the city, Ethiopian city of Aksum, under the church of the Holy Virgin Mary. Now, Ethiopia today is the Coptic church. And like the Christian church, the Catholic church, 
the Coptic Church has a, a head, like the Pope for the Christian Church. And the head of the Coptic Church, just three years ago, he was a, a visit in Germany, and the journalist asked him, do you know where the Ark of the Covenant is? And he said, yes, of course I know. The Ark of the Covenant is in, it's in Ethiopia and is protected since many generations by the same family always. And that the, the journalist continued, what is the Ark of the Covenant? And the Pope of the Coptic Church said, the inside is not from this world. The inside comes from outer space. So we would have a proof, but it's captured by the religions and they don't want that it come to public. So our scientists cannot go there and make measurements because it's somewhere in the ground under the church. Ethiopia at that time was not a, a, a desert as it is today, or Yemen. It was definitely green. We know, for example, the Sahara, the desert the Sahara, changes from desert to green every 25,000 years. It has nothing to do with human pollution, simply because of the axis of the Earth. You know, the Earth is not the perfect bull. The Earth always moves a little, and it has an influence of the sun, the shining in. So every 25,000 years, the Sahara Desert becomes green, and then there's a, the same thing happened in Ethiopia and, and in, in Yemen. At that time, it was green land there. Otherwise, we would never have this gigantic culture. So the situation was different than what we think today. There was a high culture there. I mean, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, they all lived there. Today, it's desert. The Dogon is a, a, an African tribe living in this, uh, today's Republic of Mali in, in Africa. Now, the French ethnologists observed and visited the Dogon tribe 60, 70 years ago already. And they realized, the ethnologists, that this tribe has every 50 year a gigantic festivity, a big festivity. Now, the ethnologists asked the high priest of the Dogon, why are you celebrating this festivity only every 50 years? I mean, this is a long period. Not even every generation can have be part of this festivity. Why only every 50 years? And the response was, because every 50 years, an invisible star is surrounding this star up there. And they pointed to our Sirius. Sirius is the, the brightest shining star in the Northern Hemisphere. Now the ethnologist said, come on, the reason of your festivity is because you adore an invisible star up there. But when the star is invisible, you don't see him. How can you know that every 50 years a star is surrounding Sirius when you don't see it? And the Dogon said, we know it from our visitors from the firmament. They told us this. Visitors from the firmament? Clearly. Now the Dogon have the cave paintings. And there you see an eclipse, not the perfect round. It's an eclipse. And down at the right center of the eclipse, they have made a cross. And they pointed to the ethnologist, this point, this cross, is the position of this invisible star. So Sirius, the invisible star, does not surround Sirius in a circle, but in an eclipse. And down on the right corner is Sirius. Now today, astronomers know that Sirius has an invisible star. The bright shining Sirius we call in astronomy Sirius A, the invisible star we call Sirius B. You cannot see it and its position is down on the right corner. So all this you cannot know. The Dogon, a tribe in Africa, had no telescope, had no astronomical knowledge. And where do they have the knowledge? They say it from our teacher from up there. So you have a clear proof that extraterrestrials visited and teached humans. Personally, I know the story of Platon. He describes the, the Atlantic story in every, every detail. And I think that Atlantis did exist because the details which you find at Plato are so precise. You know, he gives the measurement, he gives the exact details, how it was, how long, how many entries it was, how big the harbor it was, how many circles were there, etc. So I absolutely believe that Atlantis did exist. But normally, an island does not sink but it's the opposite. The water is growing. And we have sunken ruins in every uh, sea. So not only in the Mediterranean Sea near Malta, 
in the Pacific Sea, near Nanmadol, which is near Japan, or, or uh, in the Atlantic, these megalithic structures, they continue on the sea. So we have worldwide that the water, the level of the water has raised up, which means there was a climate change at that time, roughly 20,000 years ago, because all the, the big glaciers melted, and because of the melting, the water raised up. So we can prove that these cultures did exist at that time because of the raising of the water. I mean, humans do not make uh, constructions under water. We had not the technology to do that. So we can prove these things existed worldwide. We have to learn that we are not alone. On a simple way, on this planet, we have two types of humans. One type is religion, the other type is scientific. And the religious type of humans, they learn that God created everything, the almighty God. He created the stars, the moon, the earth, the water, etc. But as crown of creation, God made us. In the scientific part, they believe everything is explainable in the, with the, the evolution, selection, mutation, etc. But we are the top of evolution. Have you ever remarked that in both cases, religiously, we are the top of creation? Scientifically, we are the top of evolution. In both cases, we look at ourselves as the biggest, the most perfect. We do not want extraterrestrials. We have a problem. So your question was about the, the knowing. We have to change our arrogance. We have to learn to become humble again and to understand that there is life out there, and not only one form. There are many forms of life out there, and we are just one part of it. So this changes our consciousness. You know, I have an expression which I call, call the spirit of time. The spirit of time has to change. And the, the spirit of time is changing. Of course, the spirit of time changed all the time throughout thousands of years. Every generation had its problem with the spirit of time. The spirit of time is what seems to be reasonable. This is called the spirit of time. If uh, some scientific group says, for example, UFOs are nonsense, UFOs are rubbish, don't believe in UFOs. So the spirit of time says, we don't believe in UFOs, they do not exist. So they ridicule everyone who is in supporting of UFOs. So the spirit of time of extraterrestrials have to change. We have to learn we are not alone, we are part of the universe and extraterrestrials will be. That changes our consciousness, becoming a little more humble and being open. You know, until today, we are still afraid of extraterrestrials. There are theories, scientists who say, if humanity would clearly know that extraterrestrials do exist, that they were here, humanity would be afraid. They would be afraid when they return, these extraterrestrials, will they make ens enslaves of us? Will they steal our raw material? Will they kill us, etc.? So that mankind is not prepared for extraterrestrials. The spirit of time has to change slowly, and the spirit of time is changing. And I'm trying to help a little, little to change the spirit of time. But I'm not alone. Many brilliant authors are working on the same. Religion says in the beginning was God. But then we had to ask, what created God? We have no answer. Science says, now in the beginning was the Big Bang. But the Big Bang, even an atom, has to have a beginning. What created the Big Bang, the first atom? In both cases, religion or science, we have no answer. And then we have to be re very respectful. We have to learn that there is creation. There is creation, and what is creation, I call the spirit of God, the almighty, famous spirit of, of, of the universe. And that's what I pray for. In religion, you say, call it God. I call it the almighty spirit of the universe. We definitely, we have no way out because neither evolution can be explained in a scientific way nor religion. There must be a beginning. And the beginning is respectful, the grand spirit of the universe. And that's what I pray to. Definitely, there's only one God. You know, the rest is religion. Religions are all misunderstanding stories. Religions, like uh, we, we uh, learned it, is, is created of misunderstanding. You know, in Israel, the Bible, for example, they describe a God 
could ascend with smoke, fire, loud noise, trembling. And before God of the Bible descends, he orders Moses to be on a safe distance before he descends on the mountain. Otherwise, the Israelites would be destroyed. So Moses gives order to the Israelites to be in safe distance. And then the Lord descends with smoke and fire, etc. Now, I'm a big believer in God. As I said, I pray. But my God does not need a vehicle in which to move from point A to point B. My God is all over. The Spirit, all over. He does not need, need a vehicle with wheels and metallic wheels and wings like Ezekiel describes it. So the Spirit of time is the only God at, at the universe which we should adore. The, the rest is religion, and religion is misunderstanding. The reasons for destroying us, we happen in the past all the time, simply because everyone wants to be right. I am right. Only my opinion is right. Only my religion is right. Only we are right. We must kill. We must teach the others. They should be like us. It's always the, the wish, the desire to, to be that the rest of the world is like I, we be. That was the reason of, of, of the, for the war. We have to change. We have to learn that we all are humans and we all are the intelligent beings of this planet. It doesn't matter if you, what color you have, if you are white or black or red, we are all the intelligent society on this planet and we are the humans. We should respect each other. And soon as we accept we are all brothers and sisters, then the wars will stop. We have to learn from each other, to listen to the other, to discuss our problems and not to fight for it. And this is also a changing in time, which definitely is just in progress now. We should learn, first of all, that there is only one God. We should learn to uh, be peaceful with every living being, including extraterrestrials, peaceful with them. And then we should develop technologies. We should develop technologies, which of course are clean technologies, but high technology, technologies to reconstruct spaceships. You know, thousands of years ago, there was a gigantic mother spaceship. As I said before, they visited us from the mother spaceship, smaller vehicles come down. Now, if we want to spread out intelligence form of life, if we want to spread out ourselves, we have to construct spaceships. Spaceships is technology. Now, if, for example, our ethnologists, they uh, come in contact with the so-called Stone Age tribe in the upper Amazon River, we cannot say these primitives, listen, you must construct the car. That because they have no steel, they have no uh, technology, they have no industry, they have nothing to construct the car. It's completely nonsense. First, we have to, they have to learn learn mathematics, language, interaction together to develop technology. The same thing happens for the whole humanity. We must develop technologies so that we are able to construct gigantic spaceships again. The purpose is spread out intelligence form of life in the whole universe. Multiply. One time in the past, no one knows when, millions of years, the first intelligent form of life existed. We don't know how. We have no idea. That's what I said, God. The first one existed. Now this first intelligent form of life had the desire, the wish to expand, to multiply. Why? Because part of every intelligence is curiosity. If you are not curious, you are not intelligent. Curiosity means you want to find out, are we alone? Are there others? So you want to go spread out in the universe. So. Now, in the beginning, they do not start with spaceships. It's too complicated. The distances are too big. They simply spread out their own DNA. You know, in every cell, we have DNA. Here, in, only in my skin, I have billions and billions of DNA. And in every DNA is the whole information about my body, including my background, my family, etc. It's all in one DNA. Now, we simply infect a section of the Milky Way with our own DNA. Look at it like dust. We spread out some dust at the universe. Of course we know that the biggest part of our DNA, which we send out there, will come into the gravity of a sun, will be destroyed by the heat. 
Another path will carry me to the gravity of a planet which has not the possibility to develop. For example, in our solar system, we have Mercury. Mercury is too close to the sun, it's too hot. So if our DNA lands there, it simply burns. Or, or Jupiter is too big in our solar system. Too big, the gravity is too, too strong. You know, the atmospheric conditions are not for us, so it doesn't work. But the part of, of the planets in outer, outer space are like our planet Earth. And this DNA lands there. And then evolution starts automatically. I mean, evolution, you have incredible forms of life. I mean, on planet Earth, we have beetles. We have forms of animals. We have giraffe, giraffes with a long tail. So why are we? Because in evolution, you have so-called unchangeable forms. Evolution produces everything, but unchangeable forms are forced. What is an unchangeable form? If it would be an, a fish, you would never invent a computer because in the water, you cannot develop electricity. You have to go out of the water. If, for example, dolphins would be very intelligent, that they are intelligent, they jump, they see the light in our nighty sky, they ask themselves, the dumb, dumb uh, dolphins, what is this? They wanted to find out. Now to find out what it is, they have to develop telescopes and spaceships. They have to go out of the water. It's unchangeable forms. No, to develop, you cannot do this in the water. So slowly, slowly, automatically, with all the different form of life, only one form of life has the form we have, which is capable to do this technology. And we do it. We're in the middle of it to construct new spaceships. I am asking, how did it all begin? Uh, one day when I die, I think, this is my belief, I have no proof, I think we are all parts of the gigantic universe and we will go into the spirit of the gigantic universe. And my first question would be, how did it all start? What started it? Who was this spirit which we call creator or God? That's the final answer which we don't have. It is a never ending story. That's why we are intelligent. As I said before, intelligent means curiosity. Curiosity means knowing, knowing. Soon as you have solved the problem, you have the next question. Surely you have solved this question mark, you have the next question. It's an endless story until we are part of the gigantic spirit of the universe again.